All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of the broadcast. This is the Monday, February 27th, 2017 edition of the broadcast. I'm your host, Josh Reeves. Thank you very much again for being here with us for another week of shows. We've got a lot of stuff to, to get into. I've got um, I've still got stuff piling up and uh, stuff that I've been trying to get through for a long time. And then we've got still got stuff I want to continue on from last show as well. So. I love this. I love when I have so much stuff that it takes me weeks or sometimes to get to it because there's some I love that. That's so much better than having there being, uh, you know, not as much to talk about personally for me. Uh, so, yeah, I'm just going to continue. I'm not even going to really preface much here tonight. I'm just going to I'm just going to get right on the train and start talking here and then get into the stuff I want to get into <coughs> because. Um, on the last two shows that I did, they connected together. So if you haven't heard of those shows and you're listening to this show, do yourself a favor. Go back and listen to the uh, last two most recent shows before this one as well, because there's some stuff in those that uh, ties in with what we're going to be talking about here. And also with something I got from a listener that totally ties in with this. And he sent this like a week ago, even before I even did any of those other shows. So. But it ties in with some of the stuff we talked about in the, specifically the last show, so we'll get into that here with you in just a bit. My website is theglobalreality.com. That's theglobalreality.com. Everything pertaining to my work is up there from the documentary films. Right there in the middle of the page is the, uh, we'll say, buy all Josh Reeves films, including Lost Secrets, all that stuff. There's right there, that's the uh, download shop. Click on that. You can find all my documentary films in there available to download anytime, 24-7, and uh, as well as a lot of audiobooks and other great stuff in there. Lots of stuff in there that you won't find anywhere else, not on YouTube or anything. So definitely go and check that out and get yourself some downloads. And spread that around, you know. Uh, that's kind of the easiest way to spread my work. If, you, if, if you're wanting to get somebody to check out the stuff, just it's very easy to just open up that shop, download shop link and drop that on Facebook or send that to somebody. It's very, because, you know, really all of my, um, aside from the radio shows, and there is even a pack we have in there that's like, uh, you know, spans like radio shows from like 2007 all the way to 2014. It's like 50 hours. So, you know, if a lot of that early stuff that I did, I mean, including, I think, the very first Global Reality stuff from the very first show or some of the very first shows is on there. Stuff with Peter Dell Scott, which was like show number two or three. That's all on there. So if you're ever looking for something to go back and, and have kind of a retrospective of the early period of the show, uh, there's lots of great info and lots of funny stuff in there, too. It's, it's, it's just a great collection. That's all in the download shop, so go and check that out. This is our fundraising week of this week for the show, for the broadcast. We do have to reach our operating cost goal by Wednesday, 3 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, or we cannot continue our work, so we will uh, we'll definitely need everybody to be pitching in and helping us reach our goal. I also wanted to give you an, uh, an update for uh, last month as well. If you, uh, here's the thing: we can't do the um, for a while as a as kind of a um, promotional thing. We were doing like you know the lifetime memberships for the archives, which we sell because we're not going to be putting um, full shows on. YouTube and we'll be putting partial shows, some some full shows. I mean, I'm not going to say we're not going to be putting any. We still are putting some, and I've still continued to put the last two full shows up up on YouTube. But uh, we, uh, for a while, we were doing a thing. You know, where if you contribute 100 bucks, you get your um, you get a lifetime membership to the archives, which we sell for 500 bucks. And you know, we we have sold a few of those actually since we've been doing it over the past four or five years. Because it's a way, you know, you don't ever have to worry about not have, getting the show ever again. You just get the lifetime archive membership and you're done with it. But um, we get we were giving some of those away for promotions for just a hundred bucks. Um, last month we had some people that contributed that, and um, here's the thing: if you contribute and it, it go, especially when you do it through the uh, uh, the the contribution banner, you know, that has that has the progress and stuff on there, it doesn't send me your your email. It keeps that secret. So um, here's the thing: they the Podbean has now changed their software totally. And I was on, uh, I got a contacted support and was talking to support about it and everything because it really, you know, I used to be able to go in. They've totally changed the software now. 
now I can't go in and manually add any new accounts to uh, the members' archives. I can edit existing ones, you know, if you already have one. Here, here, well, here's basically just to sum it up for you short and sweet. Um, if you were supposed to get a hundred, one of the lifetime memberships and you didn't indeed get it and you want it, um, what you'll have to do is you'll have to buy like a, uh, a small period uh, subscription, like, you know, a three-month subscription or something like that. And then once you're in there and you're in the system, then I can extend the archive thing indefinitely, and then I can make it a lifetime uh, membership. Same thing if you're already a member, you already have one in there, it's lifetime. You don't have to worry about anything. As long as there's, you have your pre-existing uh, account in there with your email and all that, I can um, extend it indefinitely. That's no problem. But unfortunately, I cannot manually go in now and add new accounts or add it with just your email address like I used to be able to. Um, something about change. It's something about they changed. I guess some company that where they can take credit card payments or something. So it changed that, and they wanted like they they told me that they that they could do. Here's what pissed me off about it. They told me that they could do it. And I'd get, you know, I don't know how many they said, 50 accounts or something. I don't remember how many, how many it was that I could add. But then it would be an additional $50 a month. And, I mean, I don't, uh, there's really, there are not that many. I've looked for other alternatives. The reason I've kept Podbean for, is for, for so long is because there's so many other ones out. There's just very few other ones out there that are any good uh, for the price. Because when you start getting into storage, man, that's where you start, the money starts running up. So the... This already costs us some months. We don't even make you know make enough back to even cover the overhead of what it costs for this service every month for you know for the archiving, the hard drive space, the uh, you know the, the ability ability for it to go through uh, PayPal, all that stuff. And plus, they have apps too. That's the other thing. If you, uh, I haven't really ever promoted this, but if you have Podbean and you have a phone, they have an Android app and an iPhone app. So if you become a member to the archives, I didn't even know this for the longest time because I never messed with that stuff. But um, in case a lot of you didn't know out there, because people asked me, you know, how do I get, to, how can I listen on my phone or whatever? If I sound like I'm talking like Holly Hunter with with a lift, with I'm not going fucking gay on you or anything. I my <laughs> my, I've, you know, you guys have known I have teeth problems and stuff. So uh, I'm 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 really doing a lot better. But I had something else mess with me yesterday on the other side that was hurting opposite of what was hurting before, but, but I'm all good. I mean, I'm not in pain, constant pain like I was before. I had a little bit of pain yesterday, but, uh, yeah, it's definitely getting better, but I am, I mean, I am going to meet some dental work down the road, but anyway, I just want to say that because, uh, I kind of have to talk slowly sometimes. Um, I've, I've, I've had a real, it's funny, man. I, you know, I quit drinking like, uh, five, six years ago, 2011, very shortly after my dad died because I drink hard for like 16 years. You know, I just drink, I just used to be a fucking insane hard drinker because I just have this genetic, uh, thing where I can just, you know, I can just pound alcohol and it takes forever to get me loaded and I can just, you know. I used to start out the party by, you know, remember, you ever see uh, Animal House back in the day with John Belushi? And they're like, Bluto, and he's like, <laughs> after the, the other company, he's like tearing down the frat house. And he like jacks a bottle of Jack, he throws it to him, and he like, you know, he pops the cap on it and fucking <clears throat> just downs the whole bottle. Of, of course, it was probably, you know, movie prop, probably iced tea or whatever for the movie, but again, then again, no one Belushi, it may not have been. But regardless of that, I did it for real. I used to do that for real at parties. Like, that's how I'd start off the night, you know. Like, I'd just walk into a party, somebody throw me a bottle of Jack, I'd crack the top on it and down the whole thing in like two seconds. People go, oh, my God, oh, my God, he's going to die. Like, my friends would be sitting there shaking their head, going, he's not going to die. Are you kidding me? He's just getting started. It's breakfast for him. I remember this one time I had, a, I, I downed it. This is no bullshit. People always, there were so many witnesses to this, so. But I still have witnesses to this that were there. I, there was this party, and this chick had, she like, oh, I never tried Jaeger before, and I just got this big frosty bottle. It's like the biggest size bottle, because I could just drink Jaeger. I still can drink, like, like, like it's going out of fucking style, so 
I fucking, uh, she said, oh, I've never tried that before. Can I try a shot of it? And I had just cracked this fresh bottle, right? Cracked it. First shot I gave to her. She looks at it. She sniffs it. She slams the shot. She goes, oh, man, that was pretty good. Can I, can I have a little bit more of that? And you can just hear this ruckus in the background of people losing their shit. And I'm just standing there looking at her, smiling. And I'm in my right hand, I'm holding this empty bottle of Jägermeister, shaking it. And it's, you know, it's totally frosty cold, just came out of the freezer. And she was like, where'd he go? And then you just hear people in the back scream, he fucking drank it. He, I, this is no bullshit. I, I drank an entire bottle of Jaeger, my entire big bottle. In the amount of time it took this chick to do a shot. I mean, I used to, I used to be like the, the, the beer shotgunning champion. It was like half a second to a second. I mean, I have this guy show up one time. Hey, nobody, he showed up to this party at our house, man. Nobody had seen this guy. Nobody knew who this guy was. Sometimes people would, you know, people would come to a party, they're a friend of a friend, whatever. This guy shows up. Nobody had ever seen this guy. Nobody knew where he had just like heard from somebody like, you know, he, exactly where we lived. And there was this guy that was like the shotgun king. This guy shows up with like an 18 pack of like fucking Keystone light or something. Right. And he was like, I heard you're the, the big shotgun man. I'm coming to put you down. I was like, well, <laughs> we better get to it. then. But we're going to do this out in the fucking yard in the front yard. So number one, we got witnesses. If you know, if anything goes sideways and I have to fucking put you down. All right, number two, I don't want your fucking dumb drunk ass. I don't know fucking know you. I don't want you to come into my house and fucking spewing beer all over shit because you're gonna lose. I mean, it's really all there is to it. So I mean, it was just, I was just laughing. I was like, everybody was gathered around. It was so fucking hilarious. And I just sat there and proceeded to go one for one with this guy, nine each, on a fucking eighteen pack of Keystone Light, dude, on a Friday night before the sun had even gone down. The party even started kicking yet. And I just go, I mean, we're going one after the other. I'm just killing this guy. Boom, 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 killing him, you know. And we get to the last fucking one, and, and I'm just sitting there, and he's about to puke because he can't, he's, he can't even handle that much beer. But, you know, nine beers for me back then was, pff, again, that's breakfast. <laughs> so we get to the ninth one, man. We get, and I'm just, I even kind of like, I'm like, you know, I, I look at everybody, like, watch this. I'm give, I'm give like, I gave him like at least a good half a second jump, you know. I gave him the last, I was like, fuck it, man. I let him, you know, maybe win one. And he was, you know, not don't get him wrong. He was, you know, he was getting after it. He was going as fast as he possibly could, but it still wasn't enough. I beat him on the ninth one. Dude, the dude just goes, God damn it. Jumped in his fucking truck, sped off, sped away. Nobody ever saw this dude ever again. Nobody could ever figure out who he was, where he came from. <laughs> <sighs> But he he showed up at my place on a Friday night looking for a you know looking to take down the shotgun king. Got sent home with his fucking tail between his legs. So, uh, <laughs> that is some fucking funny shit. It's still hilarious. Still fucking hilarious, you know. But uh, so yeah, I you know I I just got to the point where. It just wasn't doing anything for. Her. I just knew, man. If I was, you know, punishing my liver for punishing your liver for an indefinite amount of time is not just is just not good, uh, not good for business, as they say. You know what I mean? So yeah, I you know I quit drinking back then, and uh, it was never it wasn't because I was an addict or, or anything. I've never had uh, anything that any monkeys, you know, that were unshakable. Never addicted to, you know, drugs or anything like that. I don't do any prescriptions at all of any kind, which really sucks when you're, when you're you know, when you're fucking having tooth pain. Let me tell you what, because you're, you're looking for that fucking hillbilly heroin and that fucking Darvacet and Percocet and shit like that when you got fucking teeth problems. But, man, I, I just won't, won't even touch it. You know, I've just seen too many of my family members go down and friends and everything else. And, you know, people I've known, people have died, just people have gone to others. You know, it's just I'm totally against this stuff, so I don't touch it. But... I'll tell you, man, the biggest monkey, this is where I'm leaving with this, the biggest monkey I've ever had in my back is fucking caffeine. Jesus Christ. Sodas, man, you know, I can't, ugh. That's been, a, that's been the toughest monkey, so, um, even though I've been off of them for a while, what that, what that caused when, uh, when I was really, really fucking soda addicted for many, many years, it, it caused me to develop bruxism which is i guess is the term bruxism i think is the term for grinding teeth and it started because i would you know i'd stay up all night or whatever 
we're doing research or playing bands or playing video games back in the day, whatever, you know, whatever it may be. It's because I was always been kind of a night owl, you know, that's where the whole late night thing do for me and this kind of work really first came into the fold. But, um, even once I got off of the, uh, of, of, of drinking, you know, as many, that many sodas, drinking all the sodas and stuff. Once you develop the teeth grinding and stuff like that from, you know, you, you drink too many sodas late night and you didn't go to bed, but you still got all the caffeine, even though you didn't drink any for three or four hours, you know, it's still running your system. So it will cause me to grind my teeth. And so, um, yeah, it did a lot of, uh, of damage to my teeth. And then later on, I guess because I'd been doing it for so long, it kind of became involuntary. So now sometimes I do it in my side. I know I've got to get everybody says, get one of those teeth guards, get one of those teeth guards. And I've been trying to do that. But every time I go to buy one of those, they're God awful expensive. I was like, really? I got to pay fucking 50 for 60 bucks for one of these fucking things, you know? Because you don't want to get some fucking cheap PCB ridden fucking shit where you're just absorbing nasty fucking plastic into your fucking mouth all night. You know, I, I don't know. Um, anyway, that's, that's what I need to do is get one of those. Cause even though I, I don't have the, that bad of a caffeine problem anymore, again, I still get to that. So, um, a couple of nights ago, I had a real bad bout of it. I guess I drank a soda or something. I didn't think it would bother me. Um, but it was, you know, it was rather late when I did it. So I guess it, it, it was still in my system. Anyway, I woke up the next day and it was like, I could tell, I like, fuck, I, I hadn't been doing it in a long time. So it, it really, it makes your, uh, it just makes your teeth feel like they're clanking together. Ah, it's, it's terrible. So yeah, that's my, uh, I've got to get off, you know, complete. I'm trying, I've, I've tried to slowly wean myself. It's difficult, man. It's, you know, it's fucked up though. That that would be the fucking thing that, that got me, you know. Not meth, not crank, not heroin, not fucking uh, pills. Goddamn caffeine, the fucking sodas, dude. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's such a that's such a non rock star puss fucking addiction, but it's real, man. I tell you, and it and what's even worse now? I tell you what, I'm grateful it's not like aspartame or something. Ugh. I've always had a natural. Uh, my body just has this natural reaction to any kind of artificial sweeteners or anything. It always has. Where, and I just have a puke vomit response or a headache response. I remember somebody gave me a, a piece of candy one time. I never take candy again without knowing exactly what it is after this. Somebody said, oh, you want a piece of candy? Well, yeah, sure. You know, it's a piece of candy. Took this piece of candy. Didn't even look. It just was like, you know, it was in a wrapper. Took it out. Put it in my mouth. The second I put it in my mouth, it was like instantaneous razor blades slicing through my brain. This is really what it felt like. It was an like instantaneous headache, with not just a headache, like a migraine with razor blades going through your brain. And I instantly, as soon as I, I put it in my mouth, I said, this has aspartame in it, doesn't it? And she's like, well, it's sugar-free. I'm like, no, 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 no. It has aspartame in it. I, look, I, I, get, I get her to give me the you know big package that they all came in so I can look, sure enough. And man, the people that get on the Diet Cokes, like, oh, Jesus. That's even, I mean, you're trading even worse. Uh, uh, oh, I don't want the caffeine or oh, I don't want the sugar. You're trading even worse of a monkey. Uh, there's, uh, well, there's been tons of studies, and there's documentaries on it and everything. Yeah, it's, it's more, <laughs> aspartame is more lethal and deadly and more addictive than heroin. And of course, uh, you know, that was, that was old Rumsfeld's baby. His direct quote, Donald Rumsfeld's direct quote, long before he was, you know, in the Bush administration, this is back in the, I guess, 70s, 80s. And, of course, Donald Rumsfeld, I don't care how many damn people it kills, I want it on the market. That's, uh, <laughs> that, that, that's, that right there shows you the intent of these type of things. When you see the willful placing of these products not just willful but the, with foreknowledge that they are indeed deadly and then pushing for these to be put on the market even though there are people who are opposing it saying it's poison so yeah that's uh you know that's definitely a big part of this anyway 
we are going to have a uh, big prize pack for the highest contributor to our operating costs this month. And uh, everybody's been asking about my teeth. Yeah, like I said, other than that little incident, I'm, they're actually doing better. The other problem I was having, I, I told you about the remineralization stuff I've been doing, has been working phenomenal. Um, it's really turned the, the clock back on my teeth. So this, this really, this thing with that I'm experiencing now currently, which is kind of affecting my speech, was the whole reason why I wanted to bring it up tonight. Um, uh, again, that's a, that's a separate thing, and I'm not. I'm, I, I mean, I'm not. Uh, I'm not in denial that the teeth problems and the in the uh, teeth grinding are indeed one of the same, but I did want to let everybody know because everybody's been asking, you know, how the teeth were doing, how to get it fixed, and and I'm doing a lot better. This is, you know, this is just another one of those things, but uh, not nearly as bad as what I was in before. I mean, it was just constant pain for it went on for like a month. You know, any anytime you have anything that goes on for more than a week or two, really, you should get it checked out. But, um. I was just constantly getting uh, misdiagnosed, you know, because, like I said, when you don't have when you don't have cavities and you don't because all the stuff when I was telling people all the remedies people were giving me were all for toothaches, you know. When we're talking big holes in your teeth, rotted away teeth, it wasn't anything. I, I had gum problems, not not teeth problems. So, um, yeah, man, I can't rec- recommend this. Uh, stuff enough i want to try and get this company as a sponsor for the show because it's fantastic stuff uncle harry's is the brand you can find it on amazon but i really want to get in contact with them see if we can work out a um you know work out a deal for advertisement because i that's not that i I want to have advertising or anything but i've always said you know if i find something that i find on my own that nobody you know nobody solicited this product to me nobody suggested it i found it on my own after going and having somebody you know look at my mouth and you know look i went to a there's a you know you can go to uh holistic dentistry there's well i mean they're pretty much in every town now even in small towns here around dallas if they have them but uh they don't do fluoride treatments and non-mercury amalgam uh fillings and stuff like that but i just went in they had like a you know like a hundred dollar i don't know just like where they just examine it and tell you what's wrong, you know? And I went in point by told him, I said, look, I, I, I'm trying to do this a holistic route. I don't have a bunch of money to spend. I don't have insurance. I'm independent radio talk show host, documentary filmmaker. Um, I just need to know what I need to do and what's going on here. Cause I've been in constant pain for a month. And then that's when I found out that about the receding gums and, uh, that again goes back to the soda drinking too. You know, that was from that and the stripping away of the enamel and stuff from your teeth. So, I found out, of course, they don't tell you this. This is my question. You know, if this is true, they should just, I mean, really, honestly, every toothpaste that's out there should just be made like this Uncle Harry's. But they're not going to do that because then the dental industry will literally be out of business within a year. If, if <laughs> you know, instead, they give you the Colgate with the fucking chemicals and the, you know, petrochemicals and nasty, nasty stuff in there. And none of it is about. And fluoride in the water too, which they tell you is, is supposed to help your teeth, which actually destroys it. But uh, you know, all this stuff, none of it's designed. None of the, the the products that they sell you are designed to do it. Another thing I wanted to give suggestion because there's a lot of people out there that had the same issue was the uh, uh, I don't know if you if you own a, uh, a carbon charcoal toothbrush, you can get them relatively cheap now. They have those on Amazon too. I highly suggest that. I meant to mention that last time when I was telling about the stuff, but this Uncle Harry's does fantastic. I got the toothpaste and the mineralization powder. Uh, but yeah, remineralization is what you have to do. For, and then uh, essentially that's what, uh, that's what I've been doing. And it's, I mean, the pain is gone. Uh, I can already feel my, I mean, my teeth feel stronger. I had hot, cold sensitivity, you know, where you drink something cold or hot and your mouth hurts. All of that is gone. Uh, it's really fantastic. It feels like I had a bunch of dental work done, and, and I really didn't. It's just naturally using these, you know, minerals. It's 100% all, all natural. There's no chemicals in any of this stuff. This Uncle Harry stuff, it's all like uh, bentonite clays and, you know, uh, sea salt and 
magnesium and, and phosphorus and calcium are the, and has all those things in it. And those are the main things for remineralizing your teeth because we just don't get enough of those things in any of our diets uh, to, to, to do that. So it's, it's fantastic. You know, it really is. I have to say that, uh, it's been like a miracle for me and I feel like I've saved myself thousands of dollars in, uh, in dental costs. See, that's what I'm saying. I, this is like a bit, this is like a fucking sales pitch. I should, these motherfuckers need to send me a check. <laughs> Seriously. I, because I know I've already got them some sales from not only from our listeners, but from people I know personally. So I need to write these guys like, look, Uncle Harry, mean you need to work out a fucking deal here, bud. Because, I mean, this stuff, you know, I'm always looking for stuff like that. Anything that can stick it to the, you know, bullshit, whatever complex, you know, whether you're talking about the military complex, the medical industrial complex, whatever it may be. But uh, that, yeah, I'm I'm all for any of those things, and that's that's the thing is, man, that's just one end of it. You know, that's just one side of it. That's just one end of the of of everything. You know, it doesn't matter, cancer, whatever it may be. All of the ailments of the human body can be healed, one hundred percent, naturally and organically by things that are naturally found on this planet, and then combined together. And that was much more difficult. It's amazing how some of these ancient cultures figured out stuff like that. It shows, you know, of course, just like I talk about the lost secret stuff, it definitely shows you these cultures had intervention and people with advanced knowledge that were coming in and bringing it to them. Because especially when you look at something like uh, uh, DMT, you know, or not, not specifically DMT, but uh, ayahuasca. You know, when you have these alkalis that are certain... I mean, it's advanced chemistry. Um, the the recipe for ayahuasca, which contains these DMT alkalis, which are found in you know the, the there's like two separate plants. You have the plant, you have the and then you got the root from this tree, and there's various different plants that you can use. But it's a very um, precise mixture, and the when they've scientifically broken it down and looked at it, you know, you're thinking, well, this is. How did somebody in the bush thousands of years ago just come up with this with, with such accuracy? And now that we have access to the whole world and we can bring plants and, and you know, essential oils and herbs and everything from around the planet, we, should, we shouldn't have less of these kind of cures. We should have way more. But the, again, they're being suppressed um, because we all know, and I don't have to go into that here, but of course the, the, the health care system is more like the death care system. That's really what it should be called. None of this stuff is about you getting you healthy or getting you better. It's simply about sucking the money out of the, the scam insurance, you know, all the insurance. Ugh. That's the biggest scam of them all, isn't it? Insurance companies, I mean, if you can get in on that racket, that's the racket to get into. That's just, I mean, that's just a license to steal is what that is. And, of course, that's what all this stuff is about. You know, um... I'm sure a lot of you at this point have, have experienced something like this in your life, depending on what age you are. If you haven't, you will. Not being a dick, just you will experience this at some point. Everybody will. Um, probably multiple times with multiple family members, as, as I have. But, um, you know, it's never fun. That moment when you realize that someone's life expectancy is... Uh, it, it, you know, especially when it's come to somebody like one of your parents or something, you know, where their life expectancy is put solely on the value of their insurance policy. I mean, and when you see that, you know, and you're confronted with it, and you have to deal with it for yourself and you realize, really? So this guy over here who could afford, you know, a better insurance policy. Because literally it was like that with my dad. I mean, it was literally like, you know, oh, it was like hope. And then as soon as like the policy, you know, it basically was in the hospital for a long time. So eventually, you know, the policy starts to get down. And then as soon as the policy's drained, right at that moment is when they tell you, well, you're not transfer him to hospice. There's nothing else we can do. Well, no, there, you could do more. Two weeks ago when, the, when you know, whenever, when there was, when the policy, before the policy was drained or whatever, <laughs> there was hope, you know. 
Uh, it's it, it's just uh, it's a big part of this continued lies that encompass this whole grand scope picture of information that we talk about here on all the topics that we get into and have for almost ten years now on this show. The uh, it's nobody 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 has to die from any of these diseases, and it's not the diseases in many cases that end up doing the job it's the medicine they give you to tell you that it's you know they convince you that you need that costs thousands and thousands of dollars from your insurance policy in order to uh be able to cure you you know it's it's yeah it, that's a whole separate deal anyway i want to get back on uh some stuff i would talked about now last time on the show i discussed the the metallica thing and I had discussed that uh, them recording at the Presidio and the connections to Michael Aquino and and that whole thing. And Alex Jones, his first documentary film, had filmed outside the Presidio, never mentioning the Aquino thing, of course. And but there is um, there's a very interesting connection. My newest film that I'm working on uh, to be out later this year, The Spellcasters Volume Two. A lot of people for years have wanted me to make this kind of film with, um, you know, showing these connections within the music industry and all the whole history of this is it. You know, this thing, I don't know how long it's going to be. It's going to be long. It's going to be across two discs. It's going to be basically two films in one because I'm not going to hold back. I've been holding back and I've cut a lot off of volume one of spellcasters and stuff. But uh, this one's really going to delve into this. So this is kind of where I've been talking about lately. And just so happens that this um, listener email ties right in with this as well it's very fascinating stuff some of this i have talked about a little bit in the past like in uh the secret right volume two and whatnot but um we're going to get it more into this here it says this is the email it says i just learned about mr reeves today and love what i've heard after listening to some of his commentaries i accidentally stumbled upon this video that just so happens to include the quote uh i seen I so he's instead of I like I have seen he spells it ice seen like cold as ice I seen your hernia comment uh well that's not the actual comment or quote what he's referring to there is Alex Jones and the whole Charlie Sheen thing and who does the view bring on is like his big you know cheerleader supporter they bring Jones on and he he's lets out this weird quote you know homoerotic sounding quote about it. Folks, he's, he's suffering from a hernia, folks. I've seen it. I've You've seen it? You've seen Charlie's? I've seen it for myself. Uh, what? I, I don't know. Uh, that just sounds really gay. I mean, uh, you got to be pretty close to a man's undercarriage, I think, to see his uh, his hernia there. <laughs> when... Uh, he says, if you if you disregard this video's title and listen to what and how it is said, especially starting at the 10-minute mark, when Boss Hog, Alex Jones, brings up the new tattoo, to some it might reveal that Charlie just might have possibly been infected by his death from above tattoo that just so happens to include a drop of blood. He was sitting with F-C, uh, F-18 pilots when he got the tattoo. Yeah, that's, that is strange. The look on Chicken Little's face throughout the interview is concerning, and it is telling as well. Um, yeah, you, you know what? This, this, is a great, this is a great email. Um, I got a lot to say. Even though this sounds kooky and crazy, Dude's on to something here. Um, the video that he's referring to is the Alex Jones, Charlie Sheen, the legendary, uh, not the first round that happened, the second round back in, I guess it was 2011. When the big Tiger Blood, Adonis Blood, you know, winning whole fucking thing happened. And I, you know... I, Listen, even at that point, I was already over Jones, and I wasn't really even paying attention to anything he was talking about. Um, 
so past when it when this video originally came out, the video that the uh, listener is referencing here, just so you can find it on your own, is Alex Jones' rant cost Charlie Sheen his job. And I thank you for sending this to me. I, you know, again, I haven't really past this initial the, uh, when this originally happened. You know, winning and all that shit. I hadn't really listened to this, and it's a great example of what I've mentioned many times here. Uh, just like I mentioned the other day with the Metallica thing, you know, with that some kind of monster thing. I mean, that was the worst music, the worst fucking shit, the worst thing you've ever heard or seen. But again, you know, you never know where you're going to find truth at. And something just told me I need to go back and watch that again, even though I knew it was bad. I was like, fuck it. It's on, you know, there's just always, I always follow those little gut instincts, you know, to go back and look at stuff because when you see something initially, you're seeing it through the lens of everything you know up to that point. But if you're somebody like me who's constantly growing, changing, evolving, learning more new stuff, especially being in research mode literally 24-7, 365 days a year and have been for, well, I mean, but even before I was doing the show, but for the past 10 years, doing just doing the show, doing that. So um, this, this was a great example of that. I'm going back and watch this watching this video because um let's see what the listener is saying here is if you don't if you don't know and you don't want to listen to the whole video or whatever at the time when all this was happening and i think he i think jones might even say that he was there while he was getting it but you're right he did say there was some military guys there with him at his house and i guess they were watching uh apocalypse now And, uh, and uh, Charlie had got a new tattoo at that time. I think Jones may even say in the interview that he was there. So Jones just goes and hangs out with military guys with it, at Charlie Sheen's house. It seems a little odd. Not as odd as... Did you guys read all the stuff that came out during Jones's divorce? Wow. Allegations about... I mean, there's there's been allegations about Jones being involved in like homosexual stuff and um, you know, admissions about one of these, it's like one of these, it was a hooker, it was a prostitute. And she admitted in testimony, it was, I think it was even in, included in Jones's divorce stuff, that um, there's this prostitute admitted, and Charlie Sheen admitted it too, I think it was one of his goddesses, that she met Charlie Sheen through Alex Jones. She was a friend of Alex Jones. So, so Alex Jones lives in, in Austin, but he's friends with prostitutes that live in L.A., and he introduces these prostitutes uh, <laughs> to, uh, to Sheen. Well, so what the, what the um, and if you don't remember, I was actually, I actually predicted that Sheen was going to, uh, it was going to happen, it was going to come out that he had AIDS, and it did. There was all this information circling about some Hollywood person that was going to come out and say they were HIV positive. I just I knew, and, and there's a reason why I knew was this was going to happen long before it did. So again, this may sound kooky to some people here uh, with what the listener here is implying. Because what he's implying, he says, uh, Boss Hog brings up the new tattoo to some it might reveal that Charlie just might have possibly been infected by his quote-unquote death from above tattoo that just so happens to include a drop of blood. Well, what he's saying there what he's implying is that um, as a part of this continued psychological warfare operation that they have used Charlie Sheen as a dupe and a part of, that to continue that narrative, um, they infected him with HIV intentionally. And that, um, you know, possibly Alex Jones and members of the military were there and, uh, and, and also participated in that. Now, that sounds outrageous and crazy and kooky and, and, and fucked up and probably not true on so many levels to so many people. But I have to tell you, unfortunately, um, man, it's crazy how this ties in with this other information I was already going to talk about. It's not too far off. Um, this has been part of, of the many tactics that the CIA has used for many years 
Um, you know, they were trying to all kinds of stuff. This stuff really originated and got perfected back. And I talk a little bit about some of this stuff in Spokaster Volume One. This stuff really got perfected back in the, um, you know, in the in the in the in the days when they were trying to uh, kill Fidel Castro. When the CIA was, you know, just after the formation of the CIA, after the end of the OSS, right in that, you know, 47, 1947 on period where they, the whole national security structure was changing. And you had the, um, the CIA Dirty Tricks Department who were coming up with all of these methodologies, you know, stuff you heard about for years, the poison dart, you know, the ice dart, the heart attack gun that the CIA had, you know, where they shoot shoots a fucking dart, ice dart. It's like really small and sharp and it goes into their skin and it melts. They have a heart attack and then there's no trace, there's no anything of it. A CIA admitted to having that years and years ago. But the Dirty Tricks Department for years has had all of these. Um, you know, that's where they really, specifically to, to try and whack Castro, giving him cancer, stuff like that. And uh, subsequently, some of the people like David Ferry and others like that were uh, uh, involved in some of the CIA Dirty Tricks stuff uh, prior to the Bay of Pigs and also involved in the Kennedy assassination and whatnot, implicated in that, which is interesting. And they and if you watch the the uh, Oliver Stone Kennedy movie, actually you, Joe Pesci's character in that, uh, yes, you, we we should put something in fucking beard, make his fucking beard fall out. You look fucking stupid then, wouldn't he? <laughs> That's the best Pesci I got. I can't can't do a very good Pesci. This is too fucking big for you. You know that? <laughs> I I I, just, I can't I I can do a little bit of Pesci, but uh, anyway. So, yeah, absolutely, this has been going on. I had mentioned when I talked about Metallica in the last show and was talking about, uh, you know, the gay connections and all that stuff. And a lot of this stuff has come out, you know, uh, especially with Charlie, you know, the the Charlie Sheen thing. All of a sudden, you know, it's not just that he has the goddesses and stuff, which there's, you know, the gay, gay talk stuff coming out and um, the sex addiction therapy stuff that was in Jones's divorce settlement that, you know, clearly was if you read it it sounds like this doesn't sound like the kind of stuff you have to go to for just addiction to heterosexual sex this this is definitely some some gay stuff so on so we set the precedent for that i'm, I'm setting the precedent to show you that it's like hollywood music industry cia and black ops and the homosexual stuff in it along goes in line with this psychological operations and uh, all of this Black Ops and everything else. I had mentioned Metallica, the gay thing, um, how it was odd that when they played at the Freddie Mercury tribute concert, a guy uh, who had supposedly, and we'll get into that too, had died of AIDS. And here's Metallica, and why? what is Metallica doing there? It just seemed odd. You know, they didn't even play any Queen music. They were first on the bill. They played three of their new songs of the Black Album and left. But then, you, you know, then you start finding out this stuff about you know, the Presidio and the connection to San Francisco and the rest of it. and um, But there's a lot of information. I don't know if I'll be able to detail. I don't probably, I probably won't. There's too much detail. Um, I'll probably do something separate on that at some point. But yeah, there, I mean, there's, you can go and look. There's tons of information for years and years, even before I came along, um, that points in the direction that, uh, that yet yeah, Freddie Mercury was, uh, actually at some point infected I, I see but there's also a lot of research that says hiv itself doesn't exist either uh, and, it, and it actually is these markers that is um well initially when it first started that's what that definitely what it was merck pharmaceuticals you know what popples are but poppers are amyl nitrates that was huge in the gay scene in the 80s um Supposedly because, you know, when you do one of these, you relax your sphincter so, you know, the dude, gay dudes can get their dicks in there easier. I mean, I'm, just not, I'm not trying to be crass. That's fucking, it's just the truth. That's why they did them. You know, it was in, to enhance the, the, the sexual thing. Well, um, Glaxo Smith and Klein, who later became Merck and all this stuff, invented these things. And when you go and look, they also were the ones that invented the first anti-AIDS drugs, AZT, all the rest of these, all ones that would later, uh, anti-cancer drugs that they were trying to use for HIV and AIDS. Um, and ultimately, that's what ended up killing Freddie Mercury. It wasn't um, 
they, they've even come out and said now, had he not taken those medicines and gone a different route, what they, what they told him, because it was the early days of that, he would probably still be here, you know, just like Magic Johnson. Remember Magic Johnson was fucking right around the same time? It was right around the same time that Freddie Mercury died. He's still living. How come he's alive and Freddie Mercury's not? Again, it's you're talking about a phony disease. They used Freddie Mercury. This goes back to the Bob Geldof thing, too. This goes back to that. Um, I'm not going to get into all that here because it gets into a whole wider thing that even goes back with Freddie Mercury. I don't want to talk about that right now. Um, again, I've talked about this before and everybody wants to get out of me. You're not going to get it out of me. Um, maybe one day I'll make a video or I'll make something with this in there, but I'm not going to ever tell anybody about to give any clues to this, but this does tie into it. But um, there's only very few people, handful of people in the world that truly know what the song Bohemian Rhapsody is about. And I'm one of them. Um, and I found this out on my own from you know years of being a fan and research and everything else and watching every clip and interview and seeing the little hints that are dropped uh, by certain people. Uh, I will say this. The song Bohemian Rhapsody, aside from the opera part, is a lot, not a lot more, um, and I wouldn't say 100% of the truth, is way more based on... Um, autobiographically from Freddie's life than I think anybody realizes because everybody, you know, the mama just killed him and all that stuff is really, it actually pertains to something that actually happened that he has never spoken about, never spoke about while he was alive. And it took place in Africa. God damn it. I just let it out of the bag. Now, fuck, I might as well just say it. Okay, here it is. This is it. You ready for this? This is an exclusive. You motherfuckers, I'm giving this up. You motherfuckers better help us reach 100% of our goal. Um, because this is, no, I'm telling you, this is, this should, this is the fucking, nobody knows this. I'm not going to give it away. It ties into Africa. I'll get, I'll, I'll get into some. Nah, I'm not going to give it away. Uh, um, it's just too much to get into here. And I'm, I'm not going to, I will get into it. If we reach our goal, we reach 100% of our goal and we are able to stay alive. I'll tell you the story. I'll tell you the real story of Bohemian Rhapsody, but I'm not going to give it away because it's too much and it's too, it interferes too much with what I'm going to talk about in this show. But we will do that. I promise you. But nonetheless, um, there's a whole thing, folks, with, the, with, <laughs> with Freddie Mercury and Live Aid and Bob Geldof and the AIDS thing and another interesting character, Adnan Kashiogi, who I talked about in the film um, The Secret Art Volume 2. If you don't know about Adnan Kashiogi, look, go look him up. He's been connected to every, I mean, everything for the last 50 years. Every major world event, Saudi gun runner. Uh, he's got a slew of, um, he had a slew of front businesses that were, many of which were located in the exact same town in Minnesota where the Genesis Communications Radio Network, GCN, Alex Jones' network, uh, that has, you know, all those other, uh, <coughs> Spooks, plants, whatever you want to call them on that network with them. Uh, well, there's a reason why. And then Keshiogi has been, uh, he's CIA connected. He was involved with the guys. That he, he was the guy that gave the money to the 9-11. Uh, Mohammed Atta, all those, the, the, the phony hijackers on 9-11 uh, that didn't really didn't hijack shit or were just there as cannon fodder, you know, to die. But uh, he had all these CIA-controlled front companies that sold all these Miracle products, exactly the same model that you see GCN following. Uh, that started back with a power hour and all and all that stuff. Under the guise of being quote unquote Christian and then selling these miracle products, that model is the Adnan Kashiogi model. And he uh, had Genesis Intermedia, Genesis this and that, Genesis everything you can imagine. And for years, Jones tried to play it off and say it wasn't the same company. Yet he could never explain away why those Adnan Kashiogi companies are founded in the exact same city in Minnesota, where Ted Anderson's GCN is located. It's not a coincidence. These are, these are the same exact people. These are the same exact groups. And the reason we know that was because of the, the uh, men are from Mars, women are from Venus guy, John Gray. Because he went on to become a 9-11 truther and appeared on Alex Jones' show talking about 9-11. And yet, who paid for that book? That book wouldn't, even, wouldn't go on anywhere. Who gave him the money that allowed that book, Men Are From Mars, Women From Venus, to become a success and paid for the promotion and all that? Adnan Kashiogi, Genesis Intermedia. It's not, that's undebated. That's on the record. So Adnan Kashiogi pays 
has all these front companies just conveniently and coincidentally, it's all just a coincidence. They're all located in the same exact city in Minnesota where Alex Jones GCN radio network is located. And then all, then it's also a coincidence that Adnan Cash Yogi, this big billionaire Saudi guy, because I've heard Jones try to play it down, but he always says, he goes, well, they say Saudi Arabia owns us, folks. They say Saudi Arabia owns GCN. That's all he'll say about it. He never says Adnan Cash Yogi's name because he knows if you go and look up that name and you see how far it connects back, it's going to go crazy. So, this guy, Cash Yogi, I don't have time to even go into the laundry list of all the black ops shit he's been involved with. Um, but when you look at his connections, to me, he's the best possible candidate for the guy who was involved in the giving of the HIV AIDS virus to Freddie Mercury. And now you're going, what the fuck? What is, how, that doesn't make any sense. How did this guy, how did we go from Alex Jones and, and GCN and, and John Gray, men are from Mars, women from Venus, and Anna Cassiogi and all that, how did we go from that to, to Freddie Mercury and getting the AIDS virus? Well, on the next, um, here's the thing. Um, Freddie Mercury found out he had AIDS somewhere in the time period in the mid-80s, somewhere around uh, 85, 86, kept it for a secret for a very long time. And then the Magic Tour in 86, um, he basically you know, said he wasn't going to tour anymore. They took a few years off. The next album they come out with, they didn't come out with an album between 86 and 89. In, in 1989, they came out with the album The Miracle. By this time, it was becoming, if you look at the videos, it became very obvious that Freddie was sick. One of the songs on this record, The Miracle, written by Freddie Mercury, was called Kashiogi Shift. And when you go and find out, yeah, he because he had this huge, um, like, yacht that had a nightclub in it. And what I've noticed is that this Cashio guy, uh, uh, on top of being this guy connected to all of these major black ops world events and everything else, gun running, you name it, he also hobnobbed with many rock stars, and rock stars hung out with this guy, and it just never made sense. Um, but there's this whole song on, on, on Queen's album about, it's all about Queen partying with Cash Yogi on the, sh on the ship and, um, some like big bodyguard messing with Freddie, you know, wanting to beat his ass or something. Anyway, while this is going on and when I started looking at that and going, wow, you know, there's Cash Yogi. He, you know, he's in that time period when when this happened is in the time period when he, Freddie contracted the AIDS virus. Freddie writes this song about this experience, which just seems kind of strange. Why you would write a song? Why would you write a song about partying on a boat with a rich Saudi billionaire? I mean, it just if you listen, I, I mean, I'm a huge Queen fan, and and as they say in uh, about Michael Bolton in the movie Office Space, I, I celebrate their entire catalog. Um, you won't find anybody who knows more about Queen than me, I can assure you. And that song is not anywhere, they would never, that band wouldn't, even in some of their, like, you know, uh, there is stuff I like, uh, There, I like all the records. Even Hot Space, which everybody says is just a gay disco album. I didn't like it so much when I was a kid. I listened to it now. It's still a great record of the great songs, and Queen's worst songs and worst records are still better than most bands' best. That's just fact. Um, but this song, Kashiogi Shit, man, it always was a not an anomaly to me because it was just not anything like they would ever write. And they did this thing on that album where they later said in the press they did it just to make basically everybody equals. Because that was the thing about Queen. You had you had four there's never been another band like this, and I doubt there ever will be. You had four guys in that band, and all four of the guys in that band had number one hit singles. A lot of people don't realize that. A lot of people associate all the songwriting, you know, to either you know, like the Lindsay McCartney's of two people, but everybody in that band from the bass player to the drummer had number one hit singles. Uh, Roger Taylor, drummer, wrote, wrote Radio Gaga, uh, which Lady Gaga, of course, took her name from, admittedly. John Deacon, the bass player, wrote um, another one, Buys the Dust, and You're My Best Friend, and all those. And, of course, Brian May, I mean, look at Brian May's <laughs> writing, and Freddie, too. But you had this band where all four members um, wrote, not only wrote songs, but you know, always had at least one, they always gave, you know, Roger at least one song per album, Brian, maybe one or two or three, 
maybe John one in uh what was interesting about the Miracle album, they had the Kashiogi song on his first album where none of the songs were attributed to being written by an individual band member. Now it was you know, when that when I first heard that, it was easy for me to just like it is like it is for us to accept most narratives that were sold about anything. You know, somebody tells you that's the story, that okay, that's it, you accept it. So Queen's story on that, well, you know, we just we didn't want this album to be about and he's right, you know, before it's all about, okay, well, I got, I got to have three songs on the album because it's all about publishing. You know, the more songs you have with, with songwriting credit on the album, the more that you're going to get. But if you do it as a band and you say all these songs are written by Queen instead of written by Brian May, Freddie Mercury, whoever, then the publishing is associated with the entity and not with an individual. And then, of course, everybody just gets an equal cut, which is really, you know, if everybody's participating, in the songwriting process, should how, how be. But now I understand that the reason why they did it that way is because that Cassiope song now, it, it, we don't really know. I've never been able to find I assume it's written by Freddie Mercury. That's from what I've been able to find. That was pretty much his, um, his song and everything. Else. But my point is, is that it's not attributed. There was some reason. See, I think that's why they did that. They didn't want anybody to look at that song and go, okay, well, you know, in case it wasn't written by Freddie and it was written by Brian May or whoever, it essentially gave them a way to not have to have the blame of who wrote that song connected to any individual of the band. You see what I mean? And I think I really think that that I have thought that that song is a clue, and that was Freddie trying to tell us. And was the next and two years later he's dead. You know what I mean? He comes out with the song about the song about Kashiogi. And then I look at these connections after this listener brought it up with, um, you know, with Jones and the death from above thing and, and saying maybe, you know, seeing F-18 pilots and military guys watching fucking Apocalypse Now. I mean, it just sounds odd, doesn't it? And then he comes up with the HIV virus. I mean, the connection to Adnan Kashiogi, since I already knew that when this, you know, normally anybody probably would look at that and think, oh, that's probably just conspiracy theory. But wait a minute. That's too, again, that's too coincidental. You can't have this many coincidences. And uh, again, I'm hoping to tie all this together in the also, or uh, spellcasters too, and all that. But so I'm sitting there looking at this, going, "Man!" And the whole time with Geldof and stuff too goes back to the you know that goes back. Geldof wanted Queen to do. Queen ended up going on in Live Aid and stealing the entire show. Um, there was a reason for that. But again, it goes back to this Africa connection I talked about with all the money actually going to install this dictator, none of the money going going to that, and that really, you know, solidifying Geldof, because what was interesting about it is during that time period, right before Freddie Mercury was uh, given the AIDS virus, there, it was a very interesting time period, because Queen had come out with that album in 1982, Hot Space, which was really the death knell for the band for them in America, because what had happened on the previous album, um, the game, it took them a couple of years. They were, you know, they had a, a, a good run of records. Those first, I don't know, five or six, seven Queen records are flaws. Uh, through, I mean, from the very, they make a pack where you can get them all in there. Queen 1, Queen 2, Sheer Heart Attack, Night at the Opera, and uh, Day at the Races. Those five, the first five, I guess. So those first five are just fucking flawless records. I, and I love all the records. Then you had... Um, you had after that you had uh, News of the World, which was a cool album because it was kind of stripped down, had some great songs on it. Then you had Jazz, um, and then which was an okay uh, record, not my favorite, but I still like it. Uh, anything they, anything most bands that were they were around in the seventies and into the eighties, you know, God, the, 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 just all the seventies stuff was just a magical time period. The recordings and the equipment being used that time, just no sound like that, and. Uh, so in that time period, you know, they had grown and become a big global act. But then when they came out with, with um, another one by the dust, see, another one by the dust was written by John Deacon, the bass player. And he was out hanging out with, um, uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, not Nils Lofgren. Now, uh, now, is it Niles Klein? The guy from, uh, the guy from Chick, you know, the bass player guy. And, uh, you know, that's where he stole that. You know, he had been hanging out 
in the studio with that band and had become obsessed with this new funk music, black music that was coming up and, and becoming popular. So he wrote the song, Another One Bites the Dust, and they recorded it. They weren't even going to put it on the album. Around that same time, here's another interesting tie-in. Uh, Michael Jackson starts going to Queen concerts because at that time, Michael Jackson was trying to, like, he, he was doing his music. You know, he hadn't, he hadn't done Thriller yet. He was about to th- do, do Thriller, which Freddie Mercury was supposed to be on. And so he was, he was really wanting to, even though he was kind of, uh, he was on Motown, you know, he had, you know, Quincy Jones. He had people that really push him towards a black direction of music, but I guess it makes sense now that we know he was trying to turn himself white, but that was not where Michael was. Michael just wasn't feeling that at the time. Michael was into rock music. He was into Queen. He was into all the big, heavy, <laughs> heavy bands. He was going to see Black Sabbath and Queen. He literally was. It's not a joke. Um, he would be he, the backstage at the L.A. Forum every night that there was a rock show going on. And that was what he wanted to do. That was his idea of what he was trying to do. He was trying to combine like the big theatrics and the big, you know, the volume and the sound and the epicness of, of a rock show with what he was doing. And the powers that be were not really having that. And generally when you get to the point of fame that Michael had gotten to, you really can get to the point where you can just throw the middle finger up and say, fuck you, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. But they had such a control over him that he never got to the point where he was able to do that and instead, the, his music was always steered towards, you know, the idea of them being able to sell mass units instead of giving Michael this freedom to do whatever he wanted to do. But he had heard, Michael heard another one bites the dust. They played it for him, studio track or something. And Michael's like, what, what's that? And I'm like, oh, it's just a stupid song. You know, we wrote whatever. We're not, we're not even going to put it out. Or whatever. He was like, that's a number one. And the thing is, at that point, Freddie Mercury and the rest of the band, they were way older than They were way older than Michael. But Michael started at such a young age, even though he was way younger than them, he had way more experience than even they did at that point. And no, everybody was like, no, and he, we're not even going to put that on the record. It's a throwaway. Another one boss doesn't us? No. He's like, that's a number one single. Put that out. You have to put that song out. If you don't put that song out, you're basically throwing away money. That's what he told him. He was 100% right. It became... <laughs> But what it did is it changed, especially in terms of, you know, back then with record labels, and it's still that way, but especially back in those days, just like with the grunge thing and the heavy metal thing before it, you know, one thing becomes a success. Oh, that was a success? Okay, we need a million more of those just like that, that are just watered-down versions. So when Queen came out with another one, Bites the Dust, and it was a huge, huge number one, it was, I think it was their probably, I think it was her first and only number one U.S. Uh, hit single, which is mind-blowing when you think about all the other songs they had, but all the other songs they had were bigger on the charts over in England and Europe and everything than they were here. But what that caused was that caused the record label to say, okay, well, we had one song on the last record, and really other, there was two songs on that record, uh, the game, that were in that funk style. You had uh, another one by Dustin, and another one which I actually like better called Dragon Attack which is on that album, which is in the, you know, kind of a funky style. But of course, because they, the first number one hit single they'd had was this sort of dancey disco funk sounding song, another one bites the dust. Well, for the next record in 82, the record label leaned on the band to push them towards putting out a um, more dance funk oriented not everything on there is disco everybody calls it queen's disco it's not a disco album the same as you know everybody calls kisses uh dynasty i'm a disco album you know the people that make these co- these comments are just writers and you know rolling stone writers people who've never listened to these fucking records in their life number one kiss dynasty is not a fucking disco record there was one disco song on that record uh, it, it just it blows my mind i mean i'm not defending them but that you know the the fact of the matter is, if you want to get right, right down to it, people always say, oh, Kiss went disco. No. No, it's worse than that. And that's what pisses me off, is, as I talked about in the last show, this revisionist history stuff. It pisses me off. No, it's worse than that. So I'm defending them on one case and trying to set the truth straight the other. No. Kiss didn't do a disco album, and they didn't try to go disco. They did one song, and the reason they did it is be, well, let's go back. Before, even before that, they were on the label Casablanca Records, okay? 
when Kiss put out through their first three records, studio records, and they did nothing. They went fucking nowhere. They were just about out of money. They could never capture their live sound on album, so they, of course, recorded the album Alive, which we all know now was not really live. The only thing live on Alive are the drums and the crowd. That's it. Everything else was stripped away except for the drums. They redid the bass, the guitars, the vocals, and everything else in the studio, mixed in more crowd noise, like triple, like triple tracked the crowd noise so it was thicker, leveled up, mixed it, put it out, and it became not only, you know, sort of the benchmark for live albums and set the craze of, of live albums that would continue from the 70s on after that, but it also gave this fledgling label, Casablanca Records, uh, it saved them from going bankrupt. Right as it saved them from bankruptcy, what acts did they have? Donna Summer, the rest of it. So, this again, the revisionist history, historians never want to mention this. They're always quick to mention, oh, Kiss did a disco record. No, they didn't do a disco record. Listen to the rest of the songs on Destroyer. There's some fucking great songs on that record that are not fucking disco. But what they did do is they enabled disco and the label that was carrying some of the, the, the what would later be the, some of the quintessential disco artists. I think they had uh, Donna Summer, the Village People. I mean, a lot of the big top. I think Kiss was maybe one of the few acts, I think, other than the band Angel. Um, that that were rock acts or even on Casablanca Records. So the success of Kiss enabled Casablanca Records to basically be a part of this explosion of uh, of bands. And there was a series that came out last year. They're not going to do a second season, which sucks. And uh, I was watching it, and I, I realized, oh, this is what this is based on. It was based on Casablanca Records uh, vinyl that came on HBO. Scorsese did it. Man, it was fucking good. I was... Uh, it got really bad reviews because people didn't really know, and people were like, "Oh, this this didn't really happen." This well, of course, but it was a, you know, it was a it was a fictional telling of stuff that that you know did happen, and and I could tell from the towards the end that next season they were probably going to be getting into the kiss thing, and then of course it got canceled. But uh, it's yeah, it's just fascinating to see how all of that plays out and loops together and comes back, you know. So, with the Kashiyoki thing, you know, here we have the this song that Queen releases, and then we have all of this stuff that goes back to that again that disco period, the disco album. You had that song, you had the album Hot Space. That song, that album. Queen did not tour ever again in America after 1982 because of that album Hot Space, which everybody, which didn't sell. Everybody saw it as just a gay disco record. There was this guy who had come into Freddie Mercury's life at that time called Paul Printer. There's not a lot of information on this guy. Um, but he was like a, a hanger-on type guy. He was kind of like that Brian Landy guy that used to hang out around Brian Wilson all the time. He was just, he was basically, you know, he was just a leech and but this is the guy who I think intro- who started introducing all of these outside influences that would later lead to the Kashiogi thing. So when this guy brought up um, the idea of the you know these F eighteen pilots and and maybe them infecting Charlie Sheen with this, I started to see how this all connected together. And I've talked about you know the fall McCartney stuff. See that ties in too. Um the whole fake Paul stuff and, you know, people don't want to wrap their minds around that. That all ties in with this too. And I'm hoping to loop all this together. Um, Paul McCartney's former wife. (coughs) Gosh, what was her name? I can't even remember her name anymore. It's been so long since I've thought about her. Um, Oh, what was her, what was her name? I got to look it up now. What was her name? Heather Mills. Yes. Heather Mills. Type, do this. Type Heather Mills. Adnan Kashiogi. I'm not going to try spelling his name for you. And you'll see all the... uh,
all the stuff about Heather Mills, this is interesting, it goes back to the whole prostitute thing too, like Jones and the prostitutes with uh, Charlie Sheen. Uh, Heather Mills actually was a high-end uh, prostitute, high-end escort. And her favorite, she was the favorite of uh, Adnan Kashyogi. She was like basically his bottom bitch for, you know, for a long time. And um, she decided she wanted to get out of the uh, of the escort service. And she didn't want to be with Kashiogi anymore. So they, they, they spun this whole story about, you know, how she has half a leg. Remember, she's on Dancing with the Stars. And, oh, she's so brave. She danced with her half a leg, whatever. Her, sto- her story is, is that she got it in some motorcycle accident, but the supposedly the real story that's gone around from somebody who was Kashiogi's, um, I guess, secretary had said that, that 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 wasn't the truth, and that actually what happened is that Kashiogi, when she told him, you know, I'm leaving, I'm out, you know, he said, oh, you're out, okay, well, there's only one way you can get out, and he pulled a sword out and whack, whacked her fucking leg off. When her and uh, McCartney broke up, there's, you can go watch the clips of this on YouTube. She, t- t- to make a long story short, she knows she knows the real deal. She knows the truth. That's why her and McCartney got divorced. During the course of her being, she was the, I, I don't, I don't imagine she's the first one that's figured this out, but she was the first one that figured it out and said, I'm not going to be on board with this. You know, just like she wasn't going to be on board, you know, she thought she'd escape a nightmare with Cassiogi, and then she probably thought, you know, oh wow, I'm, you know, I've hit the lottery here. I'm marrying Paul McCartney. Well, little did she know. Notice I haven't seen her doing any trifling ho stuff since then. <laughs> you notice that? Not at least none that you've heard of. Jesus, God Almighty! So first she gets, you know, Cassiogi. You know, think about that. Of all the dudes you can find, this this guy's been connected to every major fucking world event in the past fifty goddamn years across the planet. Who knows how many fucking skeletons that dude's got buried somewhere. She gets her leg, leg whacked, gets free of him, gets with Paul McCartney, right? After Heather, or not Heather, but after uh, Linda died. She gets with Macca. And of course, while she's with Macca, she, f- <laughs> she starts putting the pieces together and figuring out uh, he ain't the real dude. <laughs> That's uh, He's an imposter. And um, she went in the media. There's video clips you can go watch where she says, I have a secret about Paul McCartney. I know something about him. Um, this is not infidelity. This is not anything like that. This is something that will shake and shock the foundations of the fucking planet. She's like, this will send shockwaves through the whole world. She knows. She has to do She's like, I have a box. If anything happens to me, these boxes are going to be mailed out to major media and the truth's going to come out. Um, and, uh, boy, oh boy, did she take him to the absolute cleaners, the absolute cleaners. Oh my God. But I mean, Hey, it didn't matter to him. Right. I I mean, that's found money anyway. He's, he's, you know, that's found money, but you had to pay 250 million to a fucking hooker that found out you weren't the real pops (laughs) money in the bank. dude. Fuck it. Give it to her. Yeah. Don't even fucking mess with it. Just give it to her. Shut her the fuck up. Get her to stay quiet. Give it to her. Doesn't matter my money anyway. It's found money. Dude, his, his fucking money belongs to died before the fucking White Album was even made. Jesus. And, you know, I, all these connections back, uh, it's all the CIA, it's all CIA. That's really, just like I talk about in, in the Spellcasters, that's what all this boils down to. Um, I was watching, I, you know, I find truth in the strangest places. I was watching this video of Stuart Copeland once. Stuart Copeland, the drummer from the police. And um, he was talking, there's this video he did after the police were uh, not together anymore, where he's out in Africa and he's playing drums and there's this famous like video of him in this, he's in a cage in the middle of the fucking desert in Africa and he's in, the, he's in this cage playing drums and the fucking, there's lions. <laughs> there's fucking wild lions coming up and, try, and trying to scratch at him. He's playing in this cage, I guess to, you know, but I heard him telling the story about this one time and he said oh yeah we went out in this cage we're out in the middle of nowhere in this huge ranch in africa 
uh, at this rich guy's house, uh, Kashiogi, yeah, him. And I said, well, isn't that interesting? So members of the police, um, specifically Stuart Copeland, his brother, Miles Copeland, was the manager of the police. Their parents were spies, CIA spies. Uh, going all the way back to the Kennedy era, 50s, 60s. That's all confirmed. He even talks about how he went to high school over in uh, the Middle East, and one of his classmates, one of Stuart Copeland from the police, one of his classmates was Osama bin Laden. Because, of course, so Osama bin Laden was CIA. We know that. He was connected to the CIA, and, of course, his parents connected to the CIA, and we had uh, the Copeland's parents. You know, they were confirmed CIA assets. So, that, of course, all their kids would go to these you know, CIA military schools over in the Middle East or wherever they were stationed at. And he that's where he grew up. He grew up in the Middle East. And that's what influenced his drumming uh, and gave him such a strange drumming style was because he wasn't listening to American pop radio because he didn't grow up in America. Stuart Copeland grew up in the Middle East and was going to school with Osama bin Laden because his parents were CIA. In fact, his brother's first record label that he ever came out with was called CIA Records. <laughs> they didn't even hide it. They just straight up called him. He had like IRS records later on. He signed uh, REM to that record label. You know, there's, so again, yet there's another connection uh, to Cash Yogi. What was the other one? There's, there's, there's tons of them. Uh, so you know, Cash Cash Yogi, the AIDS virus. You know, these musicians. The connection back to, you know. Maca and the Beatles and the fake, I mean, all this stuff, CIA, CIA, MK Ultra, all this stuff ties together, Scientology. Here's the other kicker about that video that the uh, listener pointed out. Here's what was interesting about that. In that clip, because as I said at the beginning of the show, when I first heard that, I have not watched that Jones, Charlie Sheen clip, you know, with the fucking winning and Tiger Blood and all that. I had not watched that. Outside of when it happened in six, seven years, 2011, I had not watched it again since this listener pointed out and talked about the death from a blood tattoo and possibly this is where he got infected and all that stuff. When I went back and watched it, I was blown away. There's a part in there where Charlie Sheen says, where, he, where Jones says something about, wow, you know, they're really going to come after you now, Charlie. He's like, hey, I don't care. I'm, a, I'm, an, uh, I'm fair. I, I'm an open book. I'm fair game. And he says it in such a way uh, uh, you know, that it hit that off and went, wait a minute. Because that's, that's kind of the connection of the time they're trying to make. We already see the connections with the Sheen family to the Jesuits, and we already know the Jesuits' connection to the CIA and all the rest of that. But what we've been looking for was, this, was some kind of toehold and key to connect uh, Sheen to Scientology to really wrap up all the stuff that I've talked about in the Spellcasters and what will be involved too as well. And boy, did I find it. Number one, it was that, that, that what set me off I, in thinking about it was when I heard him say, hey, I'm free game. That's a Scientology term. Again, Jones and the rest of everybody else will tell you this is all coincidence. Just like he'll say it's a coincidence that InfoWars came from information warfare out of the Aquino mind, mind War documents. Just like he'll tell you it's a coincidence that the term Prison Planet, which was, is absolutely credited to being created by L. Ron Hubbard and was first used and showed up in OT Level 3 of Scientology, Prison Planet. So, wait a minute. If that's all a coincidence, and you have all these other people, the Stubble Binds, and all the rest of this connection, and Cash Yogi, and the connections back, and the, the Citizens Committee and Human Rights, all this stuff, all your connection to that, that's all just a big coincidence? So, you I mean, it's just, it's mind-blowing. So, I hear, I hear Sheen say, oh, I'm fair game. This, again, that's a Scientology term. For people that, um, you know, go outside or, or say anything negative, do anything about the church, the fair game policy. So then I started looking, doing some digging and seeing if I could find and, and look around. And in the film, uh, Spellcash in Volume 1, I mentioned this um, 9-11, uh, 9-11 victims de- detoxification program. And I mentioned in that 
what was interesting was that um, you had this 9-11 uh, victims detoxification thing, and it was a fundraiser, and Tom Cruise had headed it up. And Tom Cruise even openly admits in, all the, in everything you go read about it that this treatment that they were using on the first responders, this, this lung treatment that was based on L. Ron Hubbard technology. It was Scientology technology. And during the election cycle, when uh, before the election happened, and I detailed some of the connections to Donald Trump and Scientology in the film The Spellcasters, one of the things that I brought up was this interesting donation. When, you know, when they were looking at the only, um, very, very, very little charitable contributions, but the one charitable contribution out of all these charities you could think of, all the many of them that there are in the world, the only one that he ever gave any amount of money to, even though it was still a small amount, was that 9-11 detoxification program that was completely headed up by Scientology and even used Scientology L. Ron Hubbard created techniques, which is, of course we know is CIA techniques, to supposedly do these lung treatments. I talked about in the film, you know, Jim Mars, the, odd, the oddity of Jim Mars being you know, all these Scientology events that are, everybody there is known Scientology except one, and it's Jim Mars, and we're supposed to believe it, you know, they just let him come because they think he's great or whatever. That's, that's not how they work. Scientology groups in the events like that are only available and open to people who are actual members. That's the way they work. If you're not with them, you don't interact with them. That's... <laughs> That's just the, the, the bottom line of it. I, I can't believe I didn't come across this when I was making the spellcasters. You'll never guess. The only other case I've been able to find of somebody besides Jim Mars co-hosting a Scientology event was this 9-11 detoxification thing. So the co-host was Jen Elfman. And this thing where, you know, of course, Donald Trump was the only only charity he's ever given to. Why was it just conveniently a Scientology-connected L. Ron Hubbard treatment? Guess who the co-host was for that? Charlie Sheen. So I, I thank this listener for sending in this video, again, with the uh, Death From Above tattoo stuff and all that winning, because you know, I'd never heard him say, I'm fair game. The way he says it, you know, and then maybe we should, and then right after he says, I'm fair game, well, maybe we should talk about the Vatican assassin warlocks now, you know, in reference to like the Jesuit connections and, and that whole thing, the Vatican assassin stuff with, uh, what's his name? Um, I can't remember the guy's name, you know, the guy that wrote the book about all that stuff. But he says it right after he's referencing this Scientology fair game thing. And then we find out that, you know, the only two people to ever co host the Scientology. <laughs> Thanks, Chip Mars and fucking Charlie Sheen. I mean, that's all coincidence. They never thought we'd figure it out, folks. And they never counted on there being a mind like mine that has been collating data, not just on research information, but on music and culture for decades. And, uh, man, I, I got to tell you, I'm, not, I'm, 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 I'm a humble guy. I don't take compliments well. Um, and it really is all about the information, but I got to tell you, man, this is not, this is, this is not bragging. They just weren't counting on a motherfucker like me. They just weren't. And, um, I'm telling you, there's lots more for you to know. I can't talk about a lot of it now. I got to save some of this stuff for the film, but I'm telling you, um, I, we are closer folks to exposing this, blowing this whole thing wide open permanently. We've been exposing these guys for years. I'm talking about exposing these guys to where to the point where they no longer can even be, where they're no longer able to operate, where they're just done. That's where we're getting to. And, uh, you know, it's getting more dangerous and more important, and it's also uh, why it's so important that you uh, continue to support our work. We only have, you know, we're, we are basically at the red alert level now. We've got to reach 100% of our operating costs. Gold no later at 3 o'clock p.m. on Wednesday. Uh, everybody that contributes 100 bucks. Um, We'll get in the drawing for the grand prize. We'll also give a separate grand prize for whoever contributes the largest amount. We'll have a nice gem and mineral pack.
package for that person. We'll put the uh, photos up on that for that on the Facebook accounts in the next 24 hours. So you can check there. And uh, you also can pick three downloads from the download shop if you want that as well. But just go and everybody contribute and everybody help us reach our goal again so we can keep this thing going and get this important information here out uh, that we've got to do this year. So we can't do without you. And uh, the fact of the matter is this month has been a terrible month for us for support. And uh, we almost didn't make it through last month. So we've got to have your support, folks. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Take care.